Hi, everybody. Happy Thursday. It's funny, I push this little go live button and every week I'm like, is this like, is it not going to go live? <laughs> I don't know why I feel so nervous. Uh, maybe if I knew just a little bit more about computers, I wouldn't be, but there you go. Um, so I'm wearing orange today. It is uh, the first um, Truth and Reconciliation Day in Ontario, and I'm wearing orange to honor um, uh, our Native citizens who have been hurt and are continuing to be hurt by government and citizens. Um, and I know that there are a lot of incredible nonfiction novels or nonfiction books out there that you can read that are heartbreaking and informative and full of hope and information in ways that you can help. And I thought that I would give you um, one of my favorite fiction novels written by, um, sorry, Eden Robinson. Uh, Son of a Trickster is the first book. They're, it's a trilogy. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. So um, I'm gonna read you this little tiny blurb that's on the back cover copy of the book. This novel combines everyday teen existence meets indigenous beliefs, crazy family, family dynamics, and cannibalistic river otters. <laughs> that gives you a pretty good indication of what you're in for when you pick up Eden Robinson's Son of a Trickster. So grab it. You won't regret it. And one of the fun things about that novel is shared by the novel that we're talking about this, this week, which is uh, Coming of Age books. And that a really good coming of age book, like one that is like properly reflects coming of age is actually pretty hard to find. And this one, it's called Shoulder Seasons, Shoulder Season by Christina Clancy um, is really exciting because I found it because it's set in my old, like near my hometown and Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin don't get a whole lot of like novel fiction love. <laughs> So as settings. So I was so excited to read this book. And then it's a beautiful book. So let me read the back cover copy and we'll bring Christina on. Once in a lifetime, you can have the time of your life. The small town of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin is an unlikely location for a Playboy resort. And 19-year-old Sherry Taylor is an unlikely bunny. Growing up in neighboring East Troy, Sherry plays the organ at the local church and has never felt comfortable in her own skin. But when her parents die in quick succession, she leaves the only home she's ever known for the chance to be a part of a glamorous slice of history. In the winter of 1981, in a costume two sizes too small, toes pinched by stilettos, Sherry joins the daughters of dairy farmers and factory workers for the defining experience of her life. So good. Let's bring Christina in. Hello. Hi, Christina. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for writing this like really like absolutely like a true coming of age book, like about people making mistakes, you know? So it's, you know, it's funny because I've thought so much about what a coming of age book actually is. And, you know, and when I was writing this book, I wasn't thinking of coming of age. I was just thinking about, actually there was this line that I heard about how women don't come of age. They have multiple renaissances. And I thought, that's kind of true for my character. You know, I, I want, she, ha, she'll have lots of things that she goes through in her life, but you know, I think as you get older, you don't necessarily get your act together. You don't figure it all out. You just get a new set of problems and you're maybe better equipped to deal with them because yeah. of what you've been through. And I, the thing that I, that I love so much about this book that, I mean, and it's why coming of age stories make you ache. You know, they make you like cringe and ache and long is because it, you see her growing out of who she was, right? She's shedding a skin and it's, and she makes big mistakes and you don't, she makes little mistakes and cruel mistakes with her friends, but then makes bigger mistakes and you don't shy away from that. Did you? No. Oh no, I think that a lot of readers are very impatient with Sherry. You know, I wanted to really like realistically represent what it's like growing up, especially in 1981 when most of this novel takes place. If you're from a small town and you don't have a support system with your family and it's 1981 and there's a Playboy resort where you can go find a job, like you're just going to make mistakes. You know, back in yeah. the day, all the, all those bunnies were um, I, like on the one hand, I want to write about how staid the resort actually was. You know, there are all these rules. It was a family-friendly resort. They weren't allowed to date the patrons. They, uh, if a man so much as touched a bunny on the wrist, they would get kicked out of the resort by security guards who were always supervising. Yet, like any job, there's an atmosphere where things can happen. 
and you know, everyone's on Dexatrim to lose weight <laughs> and, and constantly, which a lot of people can relate to if they were, if they went through the early eighties at that yeah. time, um, and lots of cocaine and rock and roll. There's a music amphitheater right down the street. And I could just see how my character really would make mistakes, but some of the mistakes she makes, actually, if she knew better, she wouldn't have, have done what she did, but some of them pay off for her in the end. They pay huge dividends for her, but they that actually looks, work out. That's part of the beauty of those coming of age stories too, is, is, you know, that like, <laughs> that like wild step forward into the unknown you, you don't know which way it's going to go, you know, payoff or, you know, lingering mistake that haunts you for the rest of your life. You just don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, and I think that, um, you know, none of us is perfect. And one of the things I wanted to write about is as you get older, you think about the mistakes you made when you're in the heady days of your youth, but you don't really get past them. Like I, you, you still can be haunted by the things that you did years later and at what point like what has to happen for you to let go and for you to be okay so what do you suppose that is because it like i mean you know i mean i think like all of us there are nights that you lay awake and, and you think about that thing you did and whether it was big or small or whatever you weight you've attached to it like and and i feel like i seek out books like your book in an effort to feel that again that like that like Mm, cringy awkwardness <laughs> oh sorry this is my dog who if i let her in she wants out if she wants me so give me a second sorry, oh, I got it. <laughs> sorry. i'm just gonna drink my cocktail while you yes i know we've gone this we've done this whole i'm asking like the third question so we're drinking a surprisingly look at how pretty that drink is so pretty and i've a got bottle. i've got a it's like a like i've got a vintage Playboy glass with a vintage stir sticks. My friend in my friends in East Troy gave this to me, and um, it's from the actual Playboy Resort. So this is the real deal. So how did they find that? You can find things here in antique stores, you know, like it's because the resort was 15 minutes away. So they gave that to me kind of early on. So you are actually where you are. You're in East Troy right now. Yeah, I'm where a lot of the novel takes place. So this East Troy, for those of you who haven't read the book, it's the small town where Sherry Taylor comes from. And I wanted to write about the Playboy Resort because from 1969 to 1981, Hugh Hefner did run an actual Playboy Resort in Wisconsin, which is so weird. And um, so I wanted to write about that, but I was mostly interested, you know, like I would have gone to school to be an urban planner. I'm really interested in space and places. And I was interested in how, if you're from a small town nearby, how did Playboy and also Alpine Valley Music Amphitheater, how did those change the lived experience of people who before that had mostly been in a quiet small town. Yeah. And suddenly it's this glamorous, exciting place and the whole world feels like it's right outside your back door. So that was part of what I wanted to write about. So how did it, I mean, obviously you, you, you've spent a lot of time in East Troy. Did you always know about the Playboy mansion or the Playboy resort? Or is this like, did it, what 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 drew you to the story? How did it come into your life? And why now? Like, why write well, it now? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, well, for some of it, I knew... So I grew up in Milwaukee, which is uh, maybe like 45 minutes, 50 minutes away from Lake Geneva. And some of the guys I went to high school with, I remember, would be... Um, would tell stories about going skiing, mostly. Like the high school guys. Or yeah. even, even younger than high school, they would go skiing and bunnies would wait on them. They would serve them hot chocolate. Um, and I, so I heard about that, but I didn't think too much about it. And then I wanted to write about something that would take place on Lake Beulah, which is the lake that our cottage is on in East Troy, which is the town my husband's from. So like his grandfather and great grandfather were both mayors of East Troy and like people love this town so much. And, um, and no one's ever really written about East Troy that I know of. And, um, Kathleen Ernst is a is a writer from here, and I think she has mm -hmm. something kind of near East Troy, like a murder mystery. But otherwise, um, I I hadn't heard people write about the Playboy Resort. So anyway, we had a family reunion there, and I remember there was a curio cabinet outside off the main lobby that's now called the Grand Geneva Resort. So it's just this kind of like you'd never guess it was a Playboy no. Resort. It um it just I've looks been like there a bunch of times. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's actually kind of boring. You know, like it's fine. It's a it's nice a conference place. center, kind of. Yeah, it's um, it's. I'm surprised actually they don't do more to promote the fact that it was a Playboy Resort because it's a fun factoid, you know. And it was 40 years ago, so. Uh, but anyway, they just had this little curio cabinet and I was surprised at how people would talk about it. Like it was so decadent, like it was cool. Like, Hey, did you know this was a playboy resort, you know? And so on the one hand, you have people whispering about that, but then at this, on the other hand, the, the company's not promoting it. So I thought that was interesting. And I heard one of the bunnies was part of this big murder story that was really big in the eighties. Um, her name was Laurentia Babenik. They, people used to have like bumper stickers that would say free Bambi. And I, I, I don't even know the whole story, but I know that she was a Playboy bunny and that she had been dating a cop and was accused of killing the cop's wife. And she used to party right off the pier next to ours is what, what I had heard. Who knows? I mean, everything I'm telling you could be totally Sounds wrong. Sounds good. Sounds good. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, people <laughs> love telling these delicious stories. So that got me thinking about Playboy and also my own past experience there. So I had a story that was set on the lake. And then I thought, wouldn't it be fun if my, if one of the characters had been a Playboy bunny back in the day. And I just started doing some research and talking to former Playboy bunnies there. You can find them all over the place. There's lots of news articles about them. And then I was like, why hasn't anybody ever written about not only this place, but you know, I actually find it really unbelievable that in all these years, nobody's that I know of is, has ever written literary fiction about Playboy or with yeah. a Playboy bunny as a character, which is kind of disturbing. I think you know I, I'm I actually since I published this book, I'm learning how dismissive people are of Playboy bunnies, and having done so much research and talked to so many women, and le I've learned so much about how hard that job was. That it's starting to really bug me, you know. Yeah, and I, yeah. or I'll occasionally see people like tagging on Instagram. You, you, I, I don't read reviews, but sometimes you can't help but see what people are saying, you know. And they'll say, "Oh, I'm not going to read a book about a Playboy bunny." And I'm like, "Check your feminism at the door. Like, if you don't want to hear about what it was like for women 40 years ago to wear a costume and be an object of visual titillation for men, while also having." tons of fun with your friends. Like if that means you're too feminist for that, like what kinds of women's stories do you want to hear? Just the and, stories. Of Susan B. I, Anthony. Yeah, right. I mean, it, yeah. are they, they, they're only interesting if they're, if they're suffering, right? Like I feel like in part, yeah. um, that's how they want to, that's how, you know, it's, this is either a disposable, these are disposable sort of stories in women, or they want them to be, you know, hurt for their crimes of wearing gear. <laughs> like yeah. it is. And, and I do, I, I do, it is such an, I mean, it, it is ripe with all sorts of motivations, all sorts of conflict. Like it seems like it would be a thing that people would be, there'd be a lot of novels, but no, you're right. It's, it's. No, mine truly is, I think the only one. And even then I think it was kind of difficult to figure out how to market it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, do, are you, do you go for, like, is, is the thing that you push the fact that she was a Playboy bunny or is that going to lose readers? You know, like I, they didn't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'd be interested in people who are tuning into this podcast or the, our, our live stream to see, would that repel them from this story or draw them to it? And maybe right. something depends on the age that they are because Playboy changed so much over time. You know, there are a lot of older uh, people who read my book who totally get it. You know, mm -hmm. like they they remember when Playboy was considered really classy. Right. And they can relate to the idea of people going to the Playboy Resort with your mother, your grandmother, your kids. It was really fancy. It was a big night out. Um, I talked to special education teachers who had their whole statewide conference at the Playboy Resort. And all these teachers were served by Playboy bunnies. Like that was just the time that they were living in. Yeah. So it's pretty fascinating to see how then then you have younger viewer readers who watch the girls next door. Yeah. Think of Hugh Hefner in like a stained silk smoking jacket, you know, with art with women hanging off either arm, you know, it's and, it's and yeah. yeah. So it's he has a you know a, a different um perception. Yeah, and my own perception, to be fair, my own perception was not positive. I I had to stop working on the book halfway through because I thought, I don't, 
I actually think that a lot of women had really great experiences working for Playboy and they learned a lot about men and they made friends and they had the time of their lives. And it's kind of hard for me to think, well, I'm a feminist, so I'm supposed to look down on this, you know, like I think for what they were going through, I ended up with a, with a much more nuanced, complicated view of both Playboy and Hefner. He doesn't get any air in my book. Like he's kind of mentioned, but he doesn't have any scenes at all. Um, Cause I wanted to focus on the women's experience. Mm -hmm. And it did seem like, I mean, you, I mean, you have scenes where they, where they have to, like part of their job is playing games with the kids. Like, so there's this yeah. games room and they're playing go fish and she's in this costume. <laughs> that, that is from my interviews. That's true. They did supervise the game rooms and they supervised Easter egg hunts in their Playboy costumes with little kids looking for their candy while they're walking around and freezing cold. Like, you know what it's like yeah. in the Midwest yeah. in spring, it's always a crapshoot what the weather will be. And um, teaching, you know, kids how to ski and serving hot chocolate. It was- Right, all really in these costumes. Yeah, I mean, there's part of it. And I think because they were relatively safe, like there was, it, I mean, and again, I, I only know what I've read from your book, but you've make, you make it real clear that, I mean, and there are scenes that are really tense and, you know, you know, something bad is going on, but um, like, they're not getting, they're not getting groped. They're, it's not a strip club. You know, it is just this yeah. strange kind of classy resort. Um, we're getting a couple of questions. Oh, great. Here we go. Hi, everybody who's tuning in. Why oh, hi, Sharon. Nervous? I know Sharon. <laughs> oh, Sharon we're... says, uh, shoulder season is the first book she read on her Kindle. Oh, that's cool. I'm also a Kindle reader. Yeah. This is the beginning of the end for you, Sharon, when you're like, oh, I can get a book anytime I want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why do you know why they were called bunnies? Oh, oh, uh, why? Well, I'm not sure they they I mean, they were called bunnies because they wore the bunny ears, you know. Um, but I think I, I think Sharon might be asking also why they became bunnies like what the motivation was for the women and um i when i was doing my research mostly i found that most of the women who got the job there got the job because a it was way more fun than most of the jobs they could get in small towns like what are you going to do detassel corn no. work in a metal stamping factory work in an insurance agency or the general store you know for not minimum wage. Wait, tables at the truck stop where you right. were going to get you were going to get grabbed a whole lot more than right. at this place. Yeah. I mean, personally, if it were me and I was growing up here, I would love to get a job at the Playboy Resort instead where I could meet Greg Allman and the Rolling Stones and see their stretch Rolls Royce. You know, you just feel like you're doing something exciting and you get to live in a dorm. So the women lived in a dorm with other women. It was surrounded by a 12 foot barbed wire fence, which is totally crazy. Um, but I think that sounds more fun. And also they could just make so much more money. One of the women I talked to said she was one of the first Playboy bunnies. And um, she said, I made so much money in a year that I left the job and invested it in a business. And now I own four businesses. I retired in my thirties and I'm rich. And she's like in her late seventies now and still fits in her costume. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a big deal. We have another yeah. question from Allie. Did you speak to any former Playboy bunnies? And clearly you did. How many, how many interviews did you conduct? Do you know, like. I, I, I did a lot of interviews, but then also, you know, I had a year to write this book. I was on a two book contract. So I just, I remember I was, I was teaching when I was, I used to be a professor at Beloit college and I taught Joyce Carol Oates has this book called, where are you going? Where have you been? Or a short story called, where are you going? Where have you been? And it's about, um, uh, the Pied Piper of Tucson, who is a serial killer. And she read two paragraphs of that book in Time Magazine or in Life Magazine. And she, or about, about him in Life Magazine. And she decided to write her short story, not knowing anything else. Cause she felt if she knew any more details about this guy, she would have to write too much in service of the facts of what actually yeah. happened. So I was really glad I taught that because when I was working on my book, I thought I don't need to write the definitive experience of every single Playboy bunny, because I can't speak for all of them. Then there will be bunnies who are gonna say, this was not my experience, but mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to enough where it, it made sense. And then there were people I chose not to talk to. Like I, I never talked to the bunny mother. 
um, because I had an, an idea of what I wanted the bunny mother to be like. And if I talked to her, I would have felt like, oh, I don't want her to think I'm writing about her this way or that, you know, I wanted her to be kind of mean. So I was like, I don't want to, you know, the, the bunny mother, her name was Gail. You want to like her. Yeah, no, people liked her though. And I didn't want to, she was just different. The only detail I kept was that people said she wore a um, kimono when she was talking to people uh, or when she was working. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But so I, you... oh, sorry, I was just going to say one other thing. So the, one of the bunnies, um, Pam Ellis, she worked there for four years, which is really a long time. Most people only work there for one summer. And she gave me most of her, you know, the, the her experience working there. And so she was incredibly helpful. And there were some bunnies I interviewed that didn't want me to even put their names in the acknowledgements because their kids are really uncomfortable with the fact that they were bunnies which really kind of bummed me out because I had learned how hard that job was. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know, if you have a fun job like that 40 years ago, why shouldn't you be able to tell your kids about it? Stigma, man. Stigma. Stigma is real. I mean, yeah. I, I'm pretty shocked at how stigmatized these bunnies are. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to go to the map for them. Cause I, <laughs> so when you, when you put this out, were you, were you, were, was any part of you worried about, um, you know, some of these women reading the book and being like, totally wrong. You didn't get it. Yes and no. I mean, I think in some ways this is fiction. So even if it wasn't like exactly what they had experienced, I I thought, well, this is an imaginary world. It's something, you know, it's based on reality, but it's fiction. So that didn't really bother me so much. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about giving advice to aspiring writers. And one of the things that I keep thinking is it's really important to not be embarrassed easily. You know, like I think when you write a book, you just have to have a thick skin and think this is my story I'm writing. And I can't worry too much about how other people are going to perceive it. You know, if they get upset about it, it's a book, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just, I, I don't know, but so far, I've only heard people say that they thought it was actually really accurate. And I was on a panel with Candid Candace. Candace Jordan is a pretty famous Chicago bunny. She was a columnist for the Chicago Tribune. And we were doing the Chicago Lit Fest. And I was so nervous to be on the stage with her because I thought, what if she didn't like my book? What if she thought it was wrong? And she was at the clubs, which is a different yeah. experience than the resort. And she like hugged me and she said, oh my gosh, I felt like you were telling my story. My story was exactly like Sherry's. It was so creepy to see how accurate oh, it was. That's awesome. Yeah. So that was fun. You know, and if there are bunnies who felt like I really misrepresented them, I'm sorry, but I do think I wrote about the bunnies with a lot of respect. I do too. But, you know, that's what matters. Yeah, I do too. So another question, any of the stories you mentioned about the singers' bands that performed nearby based on fact or anything you didn't put in the book? You do have this great Almond Brothers uh, cameo in the book. Yeah, no, I mean, mostly what I learned about the bands was that if you were a bunny, you often got backstage passes, you would get tickets you could give to your friends, you would meet a lot of the bands at the resort, you could party with them after the shows. So I definitely wanted to include something about that. And there actually had been a recording studio in the basement of the resort. That's what I actually wanted to write about mostly. When I started, I just couldn't find enough musicians and people who remembered that recording studio. But like, I, I mean, I heard that John Cougar Mellencamp, you know, the song Jack and yeah. Diane, that he recorded it there. And it was called Shade Tree Studios. And you know that line behind the shade tree? Yeah. I always wondered, I mean, I, I might be totally off base, but I always wondered, was that I'm Cougar, if you're yeah. listening? Yeah. We're <laughs> up. I'm sure. Lines. <laughs> it's all right now. Um, no, no, no. Um, that actually, like, so you've been like out on this book tour. Like you've really been out in the world. First of all, like, how is it out there? How is it like how does it feel out there right now? Like were people excited to be out and doing stuff and talking to authors? Oh, totally. I think people are really excited to do events again. And I think the organizers are nervous, understandably so. And the, um, but the, I went to, I've been to three book festivals in the last like three weeks, basically. So Chicago um, had Printer's Row and that one was, the, it was kind of all coming together at the last minute because they were trying to make sure that they could deal with COVID and some people were dropping out because it was right when Delta 
was rising. Yeah. But I think people are used to being nimble now and knowing that things can change. There's going to be cancellations. Like people just don't get worked up about it as much. And the whole thing was outside. So I yeah. went there not knowing for sure. And I was so happy to see that it was all outdoors. It was a beautiful weekend. And then I went to the Washington Island Book Festival, which is such a treat. If you guys get a chance to go to that next year, um, just I, I like sign up for email updates or whatever through Washington Island Book Festival. Where but Washington it? Island, it's a little island at the tip of Door County, Wisconsin. Which oh, is a, wow. Yeah, it's like the Cape Cod of the Midwest. And it's a really special place. It's so beautiful. And it, you have to get there by ferry. So there's hardly any cars. It's very remote. It's geographically super interesting and gorgeous. Um, so it's there. And I think the, um, it was, everything was outside, which was helpful. Like I met with a workshop out, outdoors. And then I think it was just smaller than it usually is. So, um, and then I went to Harbor Springs Book Festival, which is another, I mean, that they had over a thousand people registered. They had to cut wow. off registration for that. And everyone wore masks. So it was fine. And then when we were on the panels, we didn't wear the masks, but it was just fine. So I, and then I had my first live bookstore event last night at Lake Forest Books in, in Lake Forest, Illinois. And I, I wasn't even sure what the mask situation was, but everyone was masked except me. Cause I, I do think it's hard to watch someone speak when they're wearing a mask. Yeah. It was fine. It was, I think we're just, it's like the new normal. We're getting used yeah. to it, but people are happy to be around other authors again. It really is kind of Zoom does a lot of great things, but it is kind of cool to be in the same room with an author and chat with them. And I mean, I'm, I, I'm a fangirl. I go to author events all the time. So I'm speaking for myself, too. Well, it was fun to follow around with you. You There's like a great picture of you talking to Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, he's. I was talking to him about Playboy bunnies. Yeah, well, I mean, you've got a good. Are you the Are you the Playboy Bunny author? Like, is that like a joke? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, you've got a good in. It was, I was standing right next to him at this reception, and I, I said to my friend Julia Claiborne Johnson, who's a she wrote "Be Frank with Me" and "Better Luck Next Time." She's a riot, so she was there. And before the event, I said, "If I'm talking to Michael Gladwell, will you please get a picture?" And I didn't think she was there. I didn't think she got one. So I was talking to him, and we ended up talking for a long time. And you know, he has that book called "Talking to Strangers." So it was kind of meta. I was like, "So what does he talk about?" <laughs> Stranger, and you know what he does? I. I think he asks you all the questions. Oh, interesting. Like, I didn't well, have a chance to ask him anything, but that was fine. Cause I was, I mean, we really had a fun conversation about Playboy bunnies and I'd, I'd actually accidentally hit a deer on my way and I'd never killed a deer before. And so we were talking about, they, they called me the deer slayer at this conference. It was horrible. I, I don't was, know how you yeah. spent any time living in Southern Wisconsin and haven't hit a deer. Like, that's what everybody said. One guy slapped yes. me. He's like, you ain't never hit a deer before. You know? But I, um, it, the worst part is the deer and I exchanged glances oh. and I, I knew, I just knew I, I slammed the brakes and I'd always heard, don't swerve, you know, just go straight. And it didn't even occur to me that I could get hurt. And then this guy in a truck saw the whole thing and he slowed down and stopped and checked on me. And he was like, did your airbags go off? And I said, no, it really wasn't that bad. And he was really worried about me. And then later on, I read about how when deer go through your windshield and their hooves, like that's what kills yeah. people. Isn't that scary? But so um, the deer didn't die. So he had to put it out of its misery. Oh, yeah. oh no. That's no, he, had a, he had a rifle in the back of his truck and he was like, just keep going and I'll take care of it. And I felt so bad. So then I went to Harbor Springs. I was literally like 15 miles away from Harbor, or 15 minutes away. I, I, I was really close to Harbor Springs. And so I walked into the festival office and I was like still running on adrenaline and feeling terrible. I'm a real pacifist. Like when I'm on my paddleboard, if there's a spider on my paddleboard, I'll go to someone's pier to save the spider. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the guy with the shotgun in his truck, he probably took that deer for meat. Mm -hmm. Right. That's another proper Southern Wisconsin thing. Yeah. My uh, my brother, who lives in northern Wisconsin now, but spent many years in southern Wisconsin, I think he's hit 10 deer in his life. You know yeah, what like you should buy him? It's $11 on Amazon. I hate to, I, I always am supporting local bookstores, so I hate even saying Amazon when I'm on a book event, but they have for $11, you can buy deer whistles and you can't hear them, but you just attach them to the hood of your car and the it, the deer hear them. And if only I'd done that, it's say I would have saved me thousands of dollars. And, Every Everybody, 
all of my friends and family in Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin, these, this will be coming in your stocking. <laughs> yeah, this is the best thing. I ordered them right away. And then I couldn't put them on my car because the, the front of my car is all messed up still. So. Oh my gosh. And then wow, last night I was driving insane. late at night and I was like, gosh, if only I had the deer whistles, like who cares if it's $11 and then they, you know, I don't know. So, so um, at one of these um, uh, panel discussions at one of these festivals, you were talking about making the Midwest universal. And I had such a strong reaction to that as, it, it, with excitement. Yes, yes, make the Midwest universal. And then my and another immediate reaction, which was like, well, the Midwest is already so universal. It, like the, the, the way that fiction handles the Midwestern United States. And I think as, as politics are more and more polarizing, um, it's really fascinating. So tell me about your, your feelings going into that panel. Um, like some of the things you thought about and maybe learned, um, about making the Midwest universal. No, Molly, we're just having a brain meld right now because I had the same reaction, you know, it, like at first I thought, Nobody is in Brooklyn right now uh, having a, a panel on being a Brooklyn writer, like how to write the Brooklyn experience. You know, like, it's just funny. Like in some ways I was annoyed. I was like, why do we have to constantly think about the Midwest as different? But then I was on the panel and like, I started getting a little hot under my collar thinking about how Midwestern writers can be so marginalized. Um, even though Right now, I mean, I follow so many Wisconsin writers and Wisconsin in particular is having such a great year. There's so many amazing books from Wisconsin writers like Lauren Fox was the Today Show pick. She's in my writing group. She's from Milwaukee. Raft of Stars by Andrew Graff. Godspeed by Nick Butler. My friend Annie Ruckjar has a young adult book called American Batia. So there's plenty of really amazing fiction that's doing well coming from here. But, um, you know, it. I was at a bookstore. I was talking about this on the panel and this woman came to the store and, and I, the bookseller was telling her about my book. And she said, are you one of those Midwestern writers who gave your book an imaginary place name? And she said, why do Midwestern writers always feel like they have to change the names of the places that they're from? You know, nobody in New York does. They'll say like on 11th and fifth Avenue or whatever, you know, like they'll name the streets. But then we were talking more and I thought, a lot of that is because people from here are known and they're from small towns. And if they get something wrong or if they piss someone off, they're going to hear about it. And mm. in New York, there's more anonymity. So if you get something wrong or you're, there's somebody in your book, you could just say it's somebody else, you know? Right. Um, so I think so that's part of the reason for that is just because we're more known. But I think that's what makes our fiction interesting. You know, I was watching Mayor of Easttown with mm -hmm. Kate Winslet and East Town actually kind of reminded me of East Troy in my book. And I actually have a sister-in-law we call Mayor. And so we call her Mayor of East Troy. Um, <laughs> but um, but that that story becomes interesting, Mayor of East Town. The more you get involved with it, the more you get to know all the people in the town and you start feeling almost like you live there. And um, I think that's what it's like with Wisconsin. I think in, on the coast, they might think that's kind of hokey. But when you're from the Midwest, that's what makes you feel like you matter. Mm -hmm. And you have value. You go to a store and people will say, oh, hi, Christy, how are you? And you turn around, you talk to your neighbor and you know the person who's cutting your deli meat. You know, like, I, I just feel like it's a, um, it's a really special experience to be from the Midwest. But somebody was talking about Charles Baxter, the writer. Of, he wrote my favorite short story, Griffin, um, like one of my favorite short stories. He teaches at the University of Minnesota. And someone was saying, oh, you know, I'm afraid I'll be considered like cute. Like it's cute to be a Midwestern writer and he's like such an amazing stylist. And, you know, um, and I, I just thought, why, why would we think it's cute to be from the Midwest? It's not hokey. And, and people would say on the panel, the one woman said that she had had a big press sell her first book. And then with her next go around, her next book was rejected on the grounds that it was too Midwestern. And I don't know. I mean, I just, for myself, I'm just saying having a book about Southeastern Wisconsin and, and Illinois and this whole region, it is so much fun. Everywhere I go, like people love having it. Down yeah. memory lane. They feel like it's so important. I say to anyone out there who's a writer, just write about the place you're from. It's really great. You just have to make sure you get everything right. Because if you get one little detail wrong, like the name of the they car, will let you know. 
1981 or whatever, you'll hear about it. You it is heard a- I got upset with my audiobook for the second home, my first book, because the narrator is from New York. And my mom called and she said, oh, my friends are very upset because she says Milwaukee. We don't say the L, it's Milwaukee. <laughs> It's all those little tiny things, right? Those yeah. little tiny things. And it's, I, I feel like coming out of, I mean, I come out of like, you know, romance and, and women's fiction where small town life, I mean, they're all given different names because they're this idealized, not real reflection of anything. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's, I, so, and, I, and it feels like, and I, I the, the feeling I had reading your book, which is not just because you were, you know, mentioning the Hormel Chili sign, which delighted me to no end, but like, I don't know, it just felt right. The, the economics of it felt right, which is a thing that I don't feel like it's seen a whole lot in in current fiction, you know, small town economics, which are often so poor with very wealthy people who live in these, some, you know, these poor communities. Like, anyway, I, I just... I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to think about that for a long time, the universal nature of the Midwest and how it's it like people will relate more to a story set in Brooklyn than they will to a story set in, you know, East Troy, Wisconsin. And I don't know why that's true. Yeah. I, I do find, you know, one thing that's interesting though, and I think Midwesterners kind of create this problem for themselves is we're too aware of how other people think of us. You know, I, we're always thinking, oh, well, New Yorkers wouldn't get this. Like, oh, they think of us as flyover country. And I'm kind of yeah. like, who cares? We we can just stand on our own. We know it's awesome here. You know, we don't need to be justified. We also know there are problems here. Yeah. But, you know, there's also problems in New York. It's not that much different. And But I think that's part of the, um, Sherry, my character, she internalizes that as well. Totally. And that's why. And I had her go to California very much on purpose or dream of going to California. I don't want to give too much away. Um, although, you know, because the prologue is set in Palm Springs. But everyone from my high school, it's like California. We mythologize in the Midwest. What yeah. California is. And um, so many of my um, friends from high school who graduated my high school class, they, they moved there. And so I wanted to have Sherry think that it's so much better in California. And then her first impression when she's driving into Los Angeles is of the freeway system and she doesn't know where downtown is because it's just so <laughs> sprawling and to her like she grew up right on the square and she doesn't understand a place like la so even though her whole life she's thought this is the, the promised land she gets there and she's a little overwhelmed and dwarfed by the city and i think a lot of people feel that way when they get somewhere they think it's going to be like here i am right. and you're just another person you know you're thoroughly modern millie yeah and then defend like the 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 process of moving back that resonates as failure, and you you know you get defensive about it. Like it's I, I know so many people like that, right? Who who left to go do something and like walked into downtown Chicago, and they're like, no, thank you. <laughs> and, but then it felt like failure going back home when it's it's just a choice. It's not a failure either way. Yeah, no, I felt that way because we moved back to Wisconsin um, and I, I didn't want to move back. I, I was, well, I mean, not because of Wisconsin, but because I was so happy. I was living in Chicago and I felt really rooted there, but my husband wanted to move back and we did. And I did feel a little bit like that, which is kind of silly when, um, but now I think the narrative's changing because with COVID, I've talked to so many people who are like, you know what? I don't want to sit in traffic for an hour each way. I don't want to miss my kids' childhoods because I'm commuting and I don't want to deal with forest fires. My sister yeah. just moved from California. Um, so I I think people are starting to um, desire this experience. But even then, you know, they'll come back to our small towns and the news will cover it. Like, you know, some enterprising people here and they're like, they want to turn this into the Silicon Valley of the Midwest. I'm like, no, just make it like Midwest. It's it's good. Well, as it it wants it to be the Silicon Valley. <laughs> but, you know, we don't need that. that that's what you yeah. said. So. Bring a good coffee shop, but leave the rest. Yeah, exactly. Sushi I'm good with. Yeah. My um uh I my small town uh in northern Illinois, I just heard has is getting a Starbucks. Ooh. And um I had an instant spike of delight and then a just total sorrow. <laughs> uh. <laughs> just, it's the beginning of the end. Yeah, well, it's easy for small towns to be taken over by franchises. And then 
they lose, you know, like the Walmart effect. Yeah, and they totally. They lose the spirit of the town. And that's what made East Troy so fun to write about because it feels still like it's a very authentic, charming place. And East Troy, you know, it's, I think people are so dismissive, again, of even farm towns because mm -hmm. there are farms here, but it's gorgeous here, you know, and there's all these inland lakes and that are spring fed and fresh. And you can just, I mean, I actually bought a bikini recently, not to show off my body, but because I love the feeling of fresh water on my skin and I wanted to feel more of it. Like I swim every day when I'm here and I'm like, where else can you do that? You know, there's yeah. not a lot of places with beautiful lakes you can just walk right into and, um, and summer camps and ski hills and, mosquitoes and, and all mosquitoes of it. humidity, 99% humidity. Okay, thanks, Molly. <laughs> all right. It's their downside. It's horse flies. I, I'm, a, I'm a nostalgic for the humidity and the mosquitoes, all of it. Yeah. Um, so I, but the last question. So your first book, The Second Home, did I get that right? Mm -hmm. The Second Home? This is You're getting some big news around this right now. Oh, you mean the TV series? <laughs> yeah, I mean oh. the TV series. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, let's hope it happens. I, I feel a little bit like, I mean, I don't know how Hollywood works and that's fair. Like, like there's, I, I, I have been in this situation before and there's a thousand ways that it can go wrong, but take the moment because there's somebody kind of exciting attached to it. Yeah. So the person who wants to star in the show, who signed up to star and executive produce is Nikolai Coster Waldau, who was Jamie Lannister on Game of Thrones and he's super hot. So and interesting and compelling and like I, mean, I don't I, I, that's really exciting. It is exciting. I'm really hopeful that it all just happens. But you know, I at the same time, people always ask me about my uh, the TV series. Like even before I had the deal, or I, or I actually knew about the deal for a long time before I could announce it. Um, but. I wrote the book, you know, and I feel like the, that was my accomplishment. You know, I wrote the book. It's cool if it becomes a TV series or a movie. And it might just sound like I'm saying this to cover myself in case it doesn't happen. But truly, I think it's just cool to write a book. And a TV series is a whole different kind of art form, you know, like the way you keep readers engaged and you break it up. And that's um, it, it feels like other people will do that. So it's cool if they do that. They can change it as much as they want. They could set it in Hawaii. Like, look at Big Little Lies. You know, like that was Australia and suddenly it's in, you know, California. So, yeah. um, but I uh, I do think it would be really cool if it happened. And right now things are looking good. I think when you have a star attached, your chances are better. Yeah, I think so too. I remember listening to an NPR um, interview with an author and I can't believe I'm not remembering the name, but they had just sold their book to become a movie or a TV show. And the interviewer was asking like, are you, you know, are you nervous? Are you involved? Are you whatever? And she's like, you know, it's like when you sell a house, like I sold them my house and I'm not going to drive by every day and give them like wallpaper. Recommendations. Yeah. <laughs> you know? oh, that's, I love that. That's exactly, yeah. exactly right. And you know, in some ways I think it's better if I'm not too invested in it because if they change things or cast it in a way that's totally different than the way, I mean, I spent years working on this book. I like Poppy, Anne, Michael, all those characters. If they walked in my house, I would know who they are. You know, I'd know how they'd smell. Like they're, yeah. to me, they're so real. Nobody they're going to cast is going to feel like the character I imagined. So I think it's, it's a little better. Just let other people decide that and see how they imagine it and go from there. And you buy your dress for the premiere and yeah. show up yeah well let's party yeah keep your fingers crossed that it happens i um you know when you're around other writers you right you know it's funny because i think with writers we're all pessimists because you, you know there's so much rejection and and things often don't work out and realists. i think it's i'm just the realists <laughs> yeah, I'm just realist. but in publishing they're like even my agent you know, when we went on submission with my first book, she's, I said, what happens now? And she said, oh, now nobody's going to get back to us. You're just going to get a lot of rejection. It's going to be months and then we'll go to the next list, you know, and, but she never wants to get my expectations up. And I think in publishing, everyone's really cautiously guarded, you know, or maybe pessimistic even in Hollywood, they're like, oh, it's going to be awesome. You know, it's going to be so great. And so I think I'm, I'm a little bit, um, like I, I, I'm a little skeptical of that. I'm like, okay, sure. you know, I'm used to being. Slow I see down, Hollywood. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm really a very dated person. <laughs> Well, I wish all the luck for all of these projects. And so do you, do you have some, are, are you working on another thing? Like, have you got the next book or are you, I mean, I know you're just finishing the tour and. This yeah, I'm, I'm working on my third book right now. I was actually working on it today and it's about these people that live. I don't want to say too much because I, but I, I'm not like one of those writers who get, who thinks that's going to jinx it, or I'm not superstitious about telling people about my project, but basically it's about these people in 1927 who live in a very insular lakeside community and everybody knows everybody's business and they have all their meals together. And I was thinking, uh, somebody gave me this funny expression where they said, it's kind of like everyone would wear the same sweater if they could, like they'd all fit into one sweater, you know? <laughs> and like, But I thought, what if you don't like that? What if that's not your idea of fun or you don't like the people and you're stuck all summer long eating every meal with them and stuff. So. That's kind of, I, I think that might've been a little bit um, fueled by COVID. <laughs> what you, every meal together all the time, day in, yeah. day out, all together. Hmm. Well, you, you know, do write your anxieties and sometimes you don't even realize it. You know, you'll think, oh, this is an idea, but you come across ideas because of what you're thinking about. Like mm -hmm. they strike you a certain way. Right. An idea, an idea post COVID is not the same doesn't strike you the same way as pre-COVID for sure. Right. But I will tell you, you will never see a book by me about COVID. I don't think, I don't think I ever want to even see that word in print. Like just, I'm, you know, wasn't it funny when, when we all started to like, I, this, this happened and I read the great influenza and I was like, how is there no art about this? Like this was a global, unbelievable situation i mean philadelphia alone it was outrageous and there's not a single short story <laughs> like, there's no, there's, like there was no art it was like it happened and they were like that happened we'll never discuss it again it's on to the roaring 20s you know see like it was and i and i and and now as we're coming out of it yeah i i won't mention i don't think i will either i don't yeah i don't i i mean i hope we're coming out of it i don't know i mean i i just it was not as fun debuting a book in June of 19 or, or 2020, you know, and actually shoulder season was originally supposed to the present day narrative was supposed to happen. I wanted Cherry to be turning 60 and she was going to be coming back to the resort in 2020. And I emailed my editor and I said, what do I do? Like, do I, do I make it COVID? Do I change the date? And she said at the time, which was so smart, my editor is so smart, but she said, you know, just change the date because we don't know what's going to happen with yeah. COVID. You know, by the time your book, between you write it when it comes out, there's a really long time. There's a whole year in between basically. And she's like, we don't know what we're going to be looking at. So I said it in 2019 instead of made Sherry the random age of 59. Which... I did the same. I have, I have a book coming out in November, 2022. That's got oh. a dual timeline. Um, and uh, yeah, I was going to set it in 2020 because that would have been the year you know, whatever, it would have made sense to be writing that. And then I was like, oh, I mean, is that, it starts at a funeral. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no funerals. People's yeah. minds will go straight to COVID if they know it's 2020. And you can write about COVID as if it didn't happen. You know, like you watch these shows like Ted Lasso, you know, you never see anyone in a mask, you know, and, it, and know. Ways, that's such a relief, but it's just, in some ways, it's like you're floating in time. You don't know what year any of this is happening because you don't have this marker of this the kind of reality that we live in and we might be dealing with masks for a long time i think people are much more aware i think i'll always wear a mask on a plane now i don't want to get a cold every time i travel uh did you ever watch the show oh yeah no flying for sure um do you do you watch the show um this is us no i haven't seen it but i know people compare that to um to the second home that was like on the 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 image board of like things that it's similar. Oh, well, that's good. That's a that's a good image board. But they, I, I'm a fan of the show, but I always watch it when the show's over because I, I don't like waiting anyway. Don't like waiting week to week. And they started filming in in COVID, and so everybody's wearing a mask. And I was just like, I, I can't. I, I'm out. Yeah. Maybe next year I'll be able to go back and watch that. But for right now, it's just. Next year might be worse. You know, you might be like. I <laughs> no, I'm not getting up. No, no, like your feelings about masks. Like even if, like, say we're beyond masks, like then you'll really be like, oh my gosh, that is so, you know, that's like so um, not what I want to see. But you know what we didn't talk about? We didn't talk about the drink. 
that we made for the Daydream. Bunny the bunny mother. I yeah, think you. I've been I've been quietly drinking mine while you have not. Well, yeah. It's like uh, a it's like a very good um, margarita, but with vodka. It's really good. I was yeah. um, and I just think it's so clever that you found a drink called the bunny mother. Yeah, I mean, this was originated in the club in San Francisco. It's so great. Like it's it's a really good drink, yeah. and I'm enjoying it quite a bit. I'm but sure you, tomorrow I'll be hung over and I'll be like, what what? <laughs> you didn't have the ingredients, so you went down to the good local Wisconsin tavern. I went to the, the bar. Can you do this in other states? Like I just went to the bar and had to make me one, and I took it home with me. I don't know if you can take drinks out of bars in other states, but they're like, no problem. They didn't even think twice about it. You did you give him the recipe? Did you have to give him the recipe? Or yeah, I gave him like, the recipe, and the the waitress took a screenshot of it on her phone, and I said, "You should make this your like drink here, the Bunny Mother." You know, you can so. Is it gonna be a book? <laughs> who knows? This could be a, a new phenomenon in East Troy. Everyone will be like, "Let's go get some Bunny Mothers." <laughs> well, I the the part of the instruction that I couldn't include on the graphic is that you're supposed to uh, float the Quantro. So I floated oh. it on my glass in my glass, and then it's just a giant. Like your first sip is a giant slug of Quantro. <laughs> that, that's not a bad thing. I like Quantro. Oh, so I've been drunk since the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> we should just keep talking. I mean, I can ask you some really personal questions and see what comes um, out. I would answer them too. Uh, but no, actually, I've kept you so long. I've kept you so long, Christina. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And you've had such a busy uh, August and September. And I just really appreciate you making the time. Oh, it's been super fun. I really loved it. And thanks for having me on the show and for reading Shoulder Season. I loved it. Everybody out there, grab grab Shoulder Season. And the next time I'm ever allowed to leave Canada and get down to visit my family, I'll I'll give you a ring and we'll meet in Beloit. Oh, we'll <laughs> at the at the Grand Geneva. Oh, we'll meet at the Grand Geneva. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can wear like bunny ears and stuff. The whole thing. We're gonna take I Wisconsin by storm, Molly. <laughs> Um, I've tried to do that already uh, with my brother. <laughs> my brother and I go to Summerfest, which is the oh. big uh, outdoor, all like all weekend long concerts or artists all day long um, in Milwaukee. Sorry, and uh, <laughs> John John Mellencamp usually like headlines one of the nights. Like talk about mm -hmm. making the Midwest universal. How did we like that guy's been making it universal forever, but. Yeah. Um, and my brother will always say to me, he'll look over at me at one night and he'll say, let's drink all the beer at Summerfest. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> it's no, and there are a lot of people competing for that, for that <laughs> honor. It's Summerfest. So I've I tried to take, yeah. I started going to Summerfest. Actually, there's a scene in shoulder season. I know you want to wrap up, but I'll- No, 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 go, go keep going, keep going. Um, but there's Wapatui, which some of the people watching, if, they, if anyone's still with us, um, but there's some Wapatui, which is just where you just take all the different, whatever alcohol you have and, and seven up and whatever, and you throw it all together in a garbage bin. And, um, and so when I was at, at Summerfest, Afterwards, I had a party when I was in high school and all my friends from, from school came and we made Wapatui and we were all so drunk. And my mom came home the next day from traveling and she never figured it out. We'd had a big Wapatui party, but it was fun to think about my Wapatui party when I was having Sherry have a Wapatui party. It all comes back. So did you, did you have a, a good friend clean up that night while you were too drunk or did you? Oh, no, just the next morning, we all just frantically you know, got all, got rid of all the empties, dumped them at the, you know, grocery store down the street, <laughs> like just took care of their, their garbage. <laughs> we didn't want anyone to know it was me, but maybe my mom knew. I always wonder now, like, did my mom actually know? And she never said anything. Um, my parents did not. Uh, Allie heard, did your mom ever find out? My parents I, did not. And my parents used to go um, on this big sailing trip every year with, with, their dear friends. And so they had a son my age and he became a dear friend of mine. And and we would, when we were kids, we would go on these sailing trips. But then when we got into high school, we, you know, you're just too busy. And so they would go without us. And then Joe, Joe, his name is Joe. It, there'd be a party at my house. There'd be a party at his house. <laughs> you'd clean up, you'd go over to Joe's, he'd clean up. You'd come, I mean, like it was just, uh, it was unreasonable. And I don't know if Joe's parents ever knew because, hmm. They were a little bit cleaner than my parents. I don't know. 
Well, you know, we didn't have cell phones. Like we weren't at home, like on our laptops or cell phones. You wanted to go out. You needed something to do. I mean, that was entertainment. I know. When I was teaching at the college, a lot of the kids just are like, oh, no, I'll just play video games at night. You know, but for us, we were, you know, there's that's how you had fun. That's how you had fun. And it was good fun. It was good fun. <laughs> my segue, <laughs> my clumsy <laughs> segue right here. Shoulder season is good fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty good fun. It's frustrating because Sherry, you know, but it's, it's a fun book. No, it's a proper com coming of age. You, you feel all the things you need to feel. Um, oh, thank you so much, Christina. You're good fun. Oh, well, uh, thank you. Are you following? <laughs> Especially now that we're wasted. Everybody out there, um, uh, grab a book, have a drink, be safe, please. Take care yeah, of yourselves. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.